All right. All right, so good morning. We're continuing on with our discussion uh, of several topics. So I want to uh, just reiterate, in my mind, we're kind of like narrowing down on things, or to me, asking questions um, leads to other questions. So we started with, what is sociology? And we got some answers to that, and that led us to the question, well, what is conflict theory? And we've been answering that question by asking, what is capitalism? And we learned a variety of key terms under each of those. So these are the main ideas, but there's other key terms you've been learning under them. For example, under what is sociology, we learned there's you know two kinds. Mainly there's you know small s sociology, which we all do, and big s sociology. Within big s sociology, we said there's three kinds. And there's uh, functionalism, symbolic interactionism, and conflict theory. We learned also about the founding fathers and some other ideas related to those uh, perspectives. And then with conflict theory with capitalism, we've learned about uh, mode of production, mode of exchange, labor theory of value. So these are all key terms. And the key terms are on the on our uh, lecture outlines. So hopefully you're looking at those or printing those out. But I'm just trying to again orient you so you see how I'm getting from one thing to another. And where I think we ended up the other day was on the question of polarization. If you remember from our first chart about what is sociology, the big concern Karl Marx had, the founder of conflict theory, the big concern he had was that capitalism doesn't can't last very long because it leads to a situation where most people end up with not enough to live on, not enough food, not enough housing, not enough health care, and a small group of people ends up with way too much. And so that term, as we saw in that chart we created, is polarization. And we started to learn the other day why that happens, or I think we got pretty far into it. What we said is that in capitalism, you have a group of owners, and you have another group of workers, and you have another group of people who are the unemployed. And capitalism is a process. It goes on over years. So over the years of, uh, well, let's just write owners in here. Owners compete with each other, or companies, we can call them, you know, they're not just individual owners like Elon Musk, although we do see that nowadays, individual owners battling each other, you know, Elon Musk versus uh, Zuckerberg. And in fact, they even want to have a, uh, a wrestling match, I think they said they want to have. But anyway, uh, ca capitalists compete with each other, work owners, capitalists compete. And as they do, some lose out. And as they lose out, they end up joining the working class, either as workers or as unemployed people. When companies fail, workers fall out of the working class and into the unemployed class. So people are falling out of here, people are falling out of here, and this class is growing bigger and bigger, and this class is growing smaller and smaller. And as it does, it makes more and more money. As we saw when we pretended that you guys were a factory, when I have fewer workers to, to use because I'm using machines, I can pay them. Uh, you know, I don't have I don't have as much labor costs. And when I'm using machines, I'm making as, so many products that I can sell them cheaper, which means I can sell more of them. And so my profits are going up, and other people are failing. And if I have less competition, then I can charge even more for my products, so I can make even more profit margin. And uh, meanwhile, working people are competing too. They're competing to see, you know, who can get a job or not. And so they're willing to undercut each other and say, hey, I'll work for less than that one. Oh, I'll work for less than that one. And so their, their share of the pie goes down. And as their share of the pie goes down, the share of the owners goes up. So you see this conflict. That's why it's called conflict theory. The interests, you know, what's our interest? Our interest is in paying workers as little as possible, and our interest is in making as much as possible. Their interests are opposed to each other. And that's why we have, you know, government involved as a kind of uh, referee, as we'll see, to try and manage this conflict between workers. Well, according to Marx, this was going to lead to a situation where there were so many poor people making so little money and so few rich people making so much money that eventually they would just overthrow them. Overthrow or 
revolution is the term. And we as sociologists could ask ourselves, well, has this happened? Has the worldwide working class come together to overthrow the capitalist system? And no, they haven't. Uh, is Marx wrong? I mean, there have been a few revolutions. So China had a revolution that they called the Communist Revolution. Russia had a revolution that they called the Communist Revolution. Cuba had a revolution. Vietnam did. These places had political parties that called themselves communists. And those political parties fought with arms to take control of the country, and they did. But almost all those countries nowadays don't even call themselves communists. China says they're pretty much a capitalist country, even though they have the Communist Party running the show. Russia doesn't claim to be communist at all. I don't know what Russia claims to be now. To me, they, they fit the model of what we would call fascism, a government that's mainly interested in waging war as a way of making money. But um, but anyway, they are not communist. Uh, China's not really communist. Cuba uh, maybe is, I don't know. Here in America, you hear people saying they're afraid of communism. We can't become communism because then we'll just be like Russia. And I'm like, well, Russia isn't communist, but they're still a place you wouldn't want to live. It's a dictatorship. And so we need to, I think, in our minds, be clear. There are dictatorships where the government is in charge and won't, you know, like Russia just killed their main, the main guy that was against Putin just died. And then people are going to lay flowers at his grave. And they are getting arrested. And it's not a communist country. It's, I don't know what it is. But it's always been a country that repressed its people. Russia, before it was communist, it was a czar's country. And they had a czar that would arrest people and throw them in the prison in the, in the, in the winter, in the cold part of the country called the Gulag. Anyway, so Russia's always been that way. So people mistake. They think communism means dictatorship. It means one guy in charge telling everybody what to do. And it's true that some of these communist countries haven't been such fun places to live, but you could ask, were they fun places to live before that? Cuba wasn't such a great place to live for most people before it was a, a communist country. But, but there's a difference, what I'm saying, between a political party that calls itself communist and then has a revolution and then is in charge of a country. That's different from what Marx was predicting here. He was predicting the whole world, working class, coming together across national lines. So that, for example, Mexican workers and American workers wouldn't be hating on each other the way they are right now. You see American workers joining Trump, saying, "Keep, you know, let's build a wall, let's keep out Mexican people." And what, you know, from a Marxist standpoint, conflict theory, we should be joining hands, workers here, saying, "You guys are only making that much down there, and we're making this little down here. Let's join hands and say we're no one's working until we make this twenty dollars an hour should be minimum." for Mexican, and I went down to Mexico and I saw, I was like, man, everybody's working here. And I said to a guy there who was a bellhop, you know, I'm like, it seems so good here, everybody has work. And he's like, everybody has two jobs, three jobs, because it doesn't pay enough down there. And so we guys up here say, don't come up here for better work, you know. We might be better off saying, let's make sure your work down there pays well. Anyway, so, but that's what, um, that's what Marxists always have dreamed of, is working people joining hands across lines, across national lines, so that Mexican workers don't see American workers as their enemy, but as their brothers. Across gender lines, you know, we should see women as our sisters in the struggle for better treatment of working people. Uh, across ethnic lines, so that black workers and Asian workers and Mexican workers and white workers would be seeing each other as brothers because, and sisters because they're working for better treatment of working people. I'm a little harping on this because this play that I'm working on that we're going to be doing at the end of the semester is all about this very question. Can working people join together so that they have better treatment by the people in charge, by the owners? Um, and we're asking, well, did this happen? Did the worldwide working class come together to overthrow capitalism? And the answer is no, it hasn't happened. And so is Marx wrong? You know, that was supposed to lead to the fifth stage. The number five would be communism. So four was capitalism. And then after the working people overthrow capitalism, they would bring about communism, modern communism. And as we, start, as we started this discussion of what is capitalism, we said it all started with primitive communism, with hunting and gathering people working together as a big tribe, working together for everybody's benefit. 
And Marx imagines that in the future, all of humanity will become one big tribe living on planet Earth, working together for humanity's growth and survival and reaching our best potential as a species. Well, that's the one that hasn't happened. And that's the one people say, well, will that ever happen? Or that doesn't seem like it could ever happen. Or people trying to make it happen are causing trouble, like the communist parties of these different countries. But we're here in America going, well, capitalism seems to be going strong. Um, where, where is the worldwide working class revolution? On the other hand, as I've indicated, and we're going to talk more about, things in some ways look like capitalism isn't working. Um, in a lot of ways. Uh, so people are asking right now whether capitalism really is sustainable. Can it continue? And so our next question then, and I don't remember what Roman numeral we're on, maybe it's five. Um, what saved capitalism? So we've now asked, what is capitalism? And we have our answer to that, and we have conflict theory's answer that it shouldn't be still here, maybe, or one day won't. <laughs> But it is here, so what saved it? And I'm going to put in parentheses the Great Depression. Capitalized. I'm putting in parentheses because the Great Depression is not one of the things that saved capitalism, but because it happened, capitalism had to change. And as it changed, it became something a little more sustainable than it was before. So what was the Great Depression, and why did it shake up capitalism? If you remember from your history classes and social studies classes, you may remember that in 1929, there was a big stock market crash. So 1929 is a long time ago, and the stock market crashed. Everybody's stocks. The 1920s were a boom time, when everybody was doing well in America, getting rich, lots of rich people around, lots of partying going on. And then 1929 happened, and the crash happened, and everybody, a lot of people, suddenly were like, oh my god, life's not good. And why did the Great Depression happen? What was, so there was this, 1929 was the stock market crash. And the stock market, if you're not clear what that is, that's a place where all the owners of capitalism come together to own capitalism. You buy stocks, you buy shares of companies. And the more shares you own, the more you're an owner of the company. And there are private companies, anyway, I don't want to get all into that, but it's basically we're at the center of capitalism, Wall Street in, in New York City, where the stock market is located, is kind of the heart of capitalism. And in 1929, it crashed. Well, why did it crash? It crashed because of what we can call an overproduction slash underconsumption Crisis, overproduction slash underconsumption. So this is something you would learn about in economics. But in the world of economics, if the companies that are you know traded on on Wall Street, if those companies are producing too many products, that's what overproduction is. They produce too many things. There's too many things on the store. This is the opposite of what happened with the supply chain. Remember we had a supply chain disruption a few years back with COVID and everything? And you go to the store and there's nothing on the shelves or there's no toilet paper and things you want? That's an underproduction crisis or really an under distribution crisis. But we're not talking about that. This one was a case of too many products being made. So we mentioned that capitalists learned that if you use machines to make stuff, you can make a lot of stuff and you can make it real cheaply. And so in the 1910s and 1920s, that's what American companies were doing, producing masses of stuff. But working people weren't getting paid very much. It was still this idea that we should just pay working people as little as possible so that we can make as much profit as possible. And these guys were getting very rich. They were known as the robber barons. These Rockefeller is one of them, J. Paul Getty, Hearst. I mean, we think of the billionaires. They weren't billionaires then, now they're billionaires. Back then, I'm waiting for the first trillionaire. We haven't had one yet. But back then, they were the millionaires, and they were the rich people, the robber barons, meaning they stole from the people, is why we call them that. And the stock market crash happened because not enough people are buying the products. If you're not getting paid enough, you can't buy all these products that are on the store shelves. You can just go walk by and look at them. And if we have too many products on the shelves as a company, so remember we were being the flax chair company last week, 
Well, if I'm the manager and I come to you and say, Black, you know, workers, we have too many products on the shelves. They're just sitting there at Home Depot, all our chairs. No one's buying them. They're not moving. That's the term they use in business. They're not moving. And if our product's not moving, what should we, what do we have to do as management? Does anybody have any management skills here or experience? What happens when your product's not moving and you've got people to pay? What does the company do? What option does it have? Never, never face this situation? They're called layoffs. So companies do what are called layoffs. Layoffs are when the company says, we can't keep everybody employed because we don't have enough money coming in. We have our products on the shelves that haven't sold yet, and we don't have any cash coming in, so we have no cash to pay you. So sorry, you're going to have to stay home. Or go look for another job. When, when things pick up and we start making money again, we'll call you and we'll, we'll, we'll hire you again. But for now, we have to lay you off. And so when layoffs happen, when you have overproduction, you get mass layoffs. Large numbers of people suddenly unemployed completely. And if people are laid off, then they really can't buy products. And if they can't buy products, then there's even more layoffs at other companies that aren't selling products. And then more layoffs and fewer products sold. So this overproduction, underproduction crisis is a vicious spiral. It gets worse and worse as things go on. And so the stock market crashed, but within the next couple of years, lots of people lost their jobs. That's why it's called the Great Depression. I mean, at first, only stockholders are upset. Oh, my stock dropped. I lost a bunch of money on the stock market. And at first, it only affects the capitalists. But as they start, as people stop buying products and things like that, then, uh, and people are getting laid off, then working people are, what happens to them? They were standing on soup lines. The image we have of the Great Depression is long lines of people just standing there waiting for somebody to give them some food. We don't see that as much nowadays, although we see homelessness now, but what happened as a result of the Great Depression? Um, well, this was a wake-up call for capitalists. It looked exactly like what Karl Marx was saying about capitalism, that it leads to an unsustainable situation where you have too many people with nothing and too few people with everything. And so, and people began to talk about a revolution. There was a guy named uh, Eugene B. Debs, who was a socialist. He was part of the Socialist Party in America, and he ran for president uh, earlier than this, than what I'm talking about, but he got a million votes running for president. And some of the capitalists running America, like the J. Paul Gettys and the, and the Hearsts and the Rockefellers, began to say, you know, we don't want a socialist party growing and attracting working people and overthrowing capitalism here in America. So what are we going to do to prevent working people from wanting to join a socialist party? Socialism, by the way, is another name for communism in a lot of ways. Um, and so, uh, so what could we do to, to prevent that? Well, Henry Ford was one of these capitalists. You probably know what Ford cars are, Ford Motor Company. I'm sure you've seen Fords on the road. They're a famous car company, and they were one of the first big car companies in America. Before Ford, cars were things that really were alienating the way Marx envisioned. In other words, if you were a working person and you worked making cars, you probably couldn't ever afford a car. You sat there all day. Cars were handmade in those days. And so if you were a worker making them, you got a dollar a day to make cars. And on a dollar a day, or it was a dollar an hour, a dollar an hour to make cars. And you weren't going to be able to afford a Ford ever, you know, a car ever on a dollar an hour. And that's exactly alienating to be putting your heart and soul and sweat into a product. And then at the end of the day, that product rolls away and you just look at it going, man, I wish I could have something like that. And some rich guy that didn't do anything all day, he gets to drive off in it. And Mark says, you know, what kind of worker would be happy with a society like that? Well, Ford wasn't a Marxist at all. He was a capitalist, but he says, you know, Marx is right about that. If I was working for me at Ford, I wouldn't want to get paid so little that I can't even buy a car one day. So Ford says, we need to change this model. We need to change how we do capitalism in America. What Fordism is, is the idea of, we, yes, we need mass production, meaning we do need to make a lot of products. If working people are going to love capitalism, there needs to be a lot of products for them to buy. 
That's what makes capitalism fun, is all the nice stuff you get to own. So mass production, but in order for mass production to work, we also need mass consumption. You need people to actually buy. That's what consumerism means, buying the things, using up the things that are made. If nobody ever uses them, then they just sit there and nobody makes profit. But if working people are getting paid enough, so what did Ford do? Ford said, I'm going to raise the salary of working people at Ford. But I'm also going to make Fords a lot cheaper. So you've probably heard of the Model T. Ford was the first company to say, let's make cars on an assembly line, the way we talked about, with machines helping to make the cars. And when they're not made by hand, when workers are on a long assembly line assembling cars, they'll be able to make a lot more of them. And if we lower the price of the car, and we pay the workers more, so that was the thing he did. He said, I'm going to pay workers $5 an hour. And everybody else in the industry was paying $1 an hour. So people are like, Ford's crazy. But he said, no, I have this model in mind where the cars will be so cheap that my workers will be able to take their paycheck from me and buy the cars that they're making. So really, I'll get the money back in a way because they'll buy the things that they're making. And that's the model of capitalism that we have. Capitalists you know, pay workers to make stuff, and then workers pay money to buy stuff, which ends up going back to the capitalists. Um, it's, uh, it's a nice, more sustainable model, a self-sustaining model. In other words, if you pay workers enough and treat them well, then they're going to be able to buy the things that capitalism makes, and capitalism can keep going. But in order for that to happen, there had to be a change in our culture as well. You can't just change the price of things and the cost of labor you have to change people's mentality as well. And so consumerism had to be promoted. Consumerism, a lifestyle, the lifestyle of shopping, the lifestyle of not saving your money, but spending your money. America, by the way, if you remember, was founded by pilgrims. We're going to learn a lot more about the pilgrims later in this class. But the pilgrims were, as we'll learn, very... Uh, self-denying people, self-sacrificing. They didn't believe in wearing a lot of jewelry or nice clothes. If we think of the pilgrims, they wore black and white and wooden shoes, very uncomfortable wooden shoes. They were not about calling attention to themselves in terms of nice clothes or nice makeup or nice hair or anything. They were about serving God. And so how did America become a place that went from self-sacrificing, serving God to being a place where we just do it? You know, that's the slogan of Nike, or it used to be. You know, just buy now, pay later, you know. Just give what you want now, pleasure yourself, whatever's fun and good, get it. Get it on credit. You know, you can't afford it, don't, don't worry now, just get it. I just heard about this lady. She was renting fancy clothes online and then selling the fancy clothes online. And then closing the credit card she was renting with, I'm like, she got caught. But anyway, um, what I'm saying is, is uh, so we've been turned into people who are told to spend our money. Don't save it. Uh, pilgrims were very into saving their money. Uh, we don't save it. We spend it. We spend money we don't have. And that all is to the benefit of consumer capitalism. But in order to turn people into these consumerists, these little hungry consumers that want to buy everything they see, and my son is having this problem. We just he has these, this money he had saved up, and he's spending it all on Robux. He plays Roblox. And not only that, on Fortnite stuff. I'm like, you spent like $100 on Fortnite. What did you get? He's like, I have the best skin. I'm like, that doesn't like help you play the game better, does it? He goes, yeah, but now I can sell my account for $300. So he's like a little capitalist. And I'm like, trying to explain to him, you know, you're going to go in debt, and being in debt is not fun. But anyway, um, you don't want to owe mom and dad money, because then I'm going to make you work outside. Um, but anyway, so consumerism, this idea that I should spend, that I want to spend, that I don't care how much I'm spending, I just need to have that new skin, I need to have that new clothes, I need to have that new thing, that all had to be taught to Americans. My grandparents grew up before the Great Depression. They experienced the Great Depression. They experienced people being on soup lines and not having enough food. By the way, this mass production, mass, I mean, the, uh, I didn't explain earlier, 25% of people didn't have a job. That's a huge amount. That's, that's why it's called the Great Depression. One out of four people. And there was no, in those days, no Social Security, no welfare, 
know anything for you. All you could do if you didn't have a job was go beg for food. And so my grandparents experienced this, and all their lives they never wanted to spend money. Even when they had money late in life that they were retired and stuff, um, my grandpa would go to the thrift store and buy pants and come home, they're like 20 sizes too big. And he was like, these are great pants. I'm like, Grandpa, they don't fit. And he's like, they were a nickel. And, uh, and I'm like, you don't need to be spending a nickel on pants. You can afford better. We would say, Grandma, we want to take you out to dinner for your birthday. And she'd be like, well, but I have a meatloaf in the freezer. We could just thaw it out and that's what we want. She's like, I'm like, why do you want to go out to eat? She goes, why do I want people serving me? I have legs. I can get up. I can cook. And I don't want their food. It's not as good as mine. So like, she had this idea that like, you should do things for yourself. You don't pay somebody else to do things you can do. But nowadays we're like, yeah, Uber, just bring me a bunch of fast food, you know, Uber Eats or whatever. Um, and so how did we go from being people who wanted to do things for ourselves and save our money to being people who want to call Uber Eats just to get a bunch of cinnamon, cinnamon rolls? Um, we've been trained. It's with advertising and marketing. I wrote advertism. Advertising. Marketing, magazines, radio, TV, movies, the internet, all of these are used to stimulate our demand, to stimulate, to get us to want the things that capitalism is creating. And they do it, they're called false needs in a lot of ways. We feel like we really need the thing, but it's, we really don't. But we want to kill our brother to get it, you know. I mean, uh, do you really need a brand new skin for your Fortnite? Um, probably not. You'd probably be fine without it. Um, and uh, but we're t uh, we're taught to want these things. And uh, you know, the movies we go to that are supposed to be entertainment. That's the other idea here with capitalism. Yeah, you work all day at a job you might hate, but what makes capitalism bearable is when you go home after work, you get to do fun stuff. Watch TV, go to the movies, go to the miniature golf, wherever you want to go. On the weekends, you get to. But what's interesting is, when you go to the movies or watch the TV show, those movies and TV shows are being used to get you to want to buy stuff. So that you have to go work more. And if you go in debt on your credit card, you're going to have to go work for capitalists more and do even harder work for them. And so it's a kind of self-sustaining system where if we can get people hooked on the products that capitalism is putting out there, then we get them dependent on the capitalists for money and work, and so people just become that much more hooked into a system of consumption, of mass production and mass consumption. And so movies and TV shows, so TV was invented in the 50s, that helped with this new model of capitalism. We'll get there, uh, we'll talk more about that. But something else had to happen before this new consumerist model of capitalism came into being, they had to pull themselves out of the Great Depression. You can't just start having mass consumption with them when everybody's unemployed. So what was going to be done? Well, one of the things that needed to be done was a social safety net. Well, I'm going to call it this. Uh, sorry. The New Deal. So Eugene B. Debs didn't get to be president. Who did get elected in right around 1929 was Hoover, who was a lot like Trump, a rich right-wing conservative guy. But then the Great Depression happened and everyone said, well, you're not doing a good job. Everybody's unemployed. We don't want this guy in charge, Hoover. And so they elected FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR, the famous president, he got elected four times to be president. People loved him so much. He was a Democrat. And he created what he called the New Deal. And he, that was how, that was his promise to the American people. If you elect me, there'll be a New Deal. What's the New Deal mean? Well, a New Deal between capital and labor. You've got capital, the capitalists, the owners on one side. You've got the workers on the other. And they're clearly in conflict with each other, leading to this problem we have in our country. So what are we going to do to get them on the same page, to get them working together so that, cap, so that our country can flourish instead of fighting each other? And the fighting, by the way, during the Great Depression and before was literal fighting. Like one of the famous ones was when the working, the automakers, I mentioned, were working in factories 
Well, it wasn't always that great for the auto workers. And in the 1930s, they did a sit down strike. They said, we're just not gonna work until you make things better for us. We're just sitting down on the factory floor and we won't work. And that led the company, General Motors, to like send out armed guards and stuff. And there was like literal fighting and warfare between working people and the owners. And so FDR says, we need a new deal. We need um, these two sides to stop killing each other. And so the New Deal, it's the government as referee between capitalists or capital and workers. Before this, the government mainly was a tool of the capitalists, you know, help us make as much money as possible and help keep the working people down. But, uh, but FDR starts saying, no, we need to give the working people more power, more respect in our society. And we need to do it by um, seeing the government's role as kind of the referee in a boxing match. Like in a boxing match, the referee's job is to make sure that these two sides do fight each other, do have conflict, but not in an unfair way, not in a way that's going to lead to really bad outcomes. And so how can we have a fair fight in capitalism where working people are competing to you know, get ahead and capitalists are competing to get ahead, but the two sides are not you know, destroying each other? Well, one of the main things you can do is called um, collective bargaining. Unions is what these are known as nowadays. Before this, it was kind of illegal for you for as a working person to say, I'm gonna to join together with other working people for better pay. But that's what a union is. It's called collective bargaining because when you go by yourself as an individual, if you try to bargain with your boss, negotiate with your boss and say, hey boss, can you give me a raise? Can you please give me a raise? How are you gonna convince your boss to give you a raise? I mean, you could bring in a little picture of your starving child or something. Um, and go, please, please give me a raise. And the boss will go, well, I'd love to. You know, it's a cute kid you got there, but you know, I got a thousand other workers. And if I give you a raise, I'm gonna have to give them all a raise and we'll all go out of business. So sorry, you know, cute kid, but go back to work, please, now. In other words, as a single worker, you have no power over your boss. But if all the workers of the company come in and say, boss, we really think this pay you're giving us $10 an hour is not enough. We feel we've looked at your profits and you can give us more. That's called collective bargaining. We're coming in as a collective, as a group, and we're saying as a group, we feel the management is not treating this group of people the right way. And if you can collectively bargain, you have a lot more power against the, the capitalists than you do as a single individual working person. And so that's the idea of a union, instead of each individual person having a contract with the boss, the group of workers has a contract with the boss, and the group of workers has to be respected as a group. And so Roosevelt said, we need to allow this, and so the, the Wagner Act was passed, a new law, that made it much more possible for working people to form unions. But it made it much more, made it very regulated about how you do it. In other words, you can't just have a sit down strike in the middle of the day and just say, we're on strike. You have to follow very careful procedures for how you form your union. You have to take votes about it. You have to show that the majority want it. And then if you're going to do something like a strike or a picket line, you have to give notice to the, to the bosses and say, we're, this is what we're planning to do. These are our demands. And if they meet the demands before that, you can't do the strike. I mean, there's a lot of rules in the Wagner Act about how unions are supposed to function. But it led to a big change in America, where lots of working people now got to be part of unions, and as unions, they got to get paid a lot more than they were getting paid as just individually exploited workers in factories. And Roosevelt knew, and the capitalists knew, that if we allow this, where our profits are going to go down in terms of our immediate profits, because we're going to have to pay workers more. We're going to have to give them things like health benefits and stuff like that. But they also knew, based on the Ford for this model, if we change capitalism so that working people actually do get taken care of better, it's going to be better for us all. 
it's uh, what the way Roosevelt put it is a rising tide lifts all boats. In other words, if the if the tide is going up, then we're all doing better. Or he said another thing he said was a, a chicken in every pot, meaning if everybody's got real chicken at home to cook, you know, we're all doing better. And if working people have food in their bellies, they're better workers, not worse workers. So it's a good idea to take care of the working people, is what Roosevelt said and this New Deal said. And part of that wasn't only unions, a big part of it was um, the social safety net. So the New Deal was a set of reforms to capitalism, a set of changes to our capitalist system. One was letting workers have unions. Another one was making the government more what we call socialist, uh, making the government more helping working people survive, not just controlling them and saying, you're going to go to jail if you do that, or we're going to arrest you if you do that. But having programs and things, things that help working people get on their feet so they don't want to commit crime, and things like that. Um, the social safety net. What is the social safety net? What's in it? Well, one of the first things was unemployment insurance. To say, if you lose your job for reasons that have nothing to do with you, if you get laid off because there was a production, overproduction crisis, you shouldn't have to starve and your kids starve because the economy changed and you had nothing to do with it. Because you were such a good worker and you were so productive, now you're fired. Um, no, unemployment insurance says if we all pay into a fund while we're working, then if some of us get laid off from a job, then we can go to the government and get some income while we're looking for a new job. That way you don't end up just uh, on the street looking for a handout. It's called a safety net because the reference is to trapeze artists. Trapeze artists swing you know, from the high things at the circus, but they have a big net there. If they fell to the ground, splat, it would not be a fun circus to go to and you wouldn't bring your kids there. But it's good that they get caught. It's still thrilling to see them swinging, but then when they fall, they don't die. They bounce back up. And so the social safety net's the same idea that if you fall out of the unemployment, you fall out of the employment group, like we showed those people falling out, instead of just going splat on the ground, you get caught by something. Something's there to catch you and hold you to help you keep paying your bills, keep feeding your kids. So a big one was not only unemployment insurance, but Social Security. This was a new idea. Let's pay money. Everybody, when you get paid at your job, you pay money into a fund called Social Security. And then if you get sick or too old to work or injured, you have these, uh, this fund to draw on and you can still get an income so that you're not just completely broke and asking some church to give you some soup. You can still be on your feet. You can still get, keep going. Welfare was another one. Welfare was originally for women whose husbands were killed in the war. And the idea was she has children at home that she's taking care of, and now her husband died fighting for the country. Should we just let her be poor and her children be poor? Do you have to give up her children? Or should we have income for women whose husbands died serving the country? But welfare eventually became something that we said, well, anybody who's been serving the country, so to speak, by working, should be able to, or even if they can't work, if you're a widow, you can't really work, you gotta take care of your kids. If you're a single mother because your husband left you, or you know, something like that, uh, if you're just poor and don't have enough, the idea was we wanted to make sure people are not on the street starving, living in tents on the sidewalk. We want to make sure they can pay some rent and stuff like that. I'm kind of highlighting by the way I'm talking about it that we don't really believe this in some way. And as we're going to see nowadays, we don't have the social safety net the way we used to. But at this time in the 1930s, the idea was we want to have a strong safety net so working people can get back on their feet or never end up completely on their, on their back. And the other idea here was public employment. Public means government employment as opposed to private employment. When industry isn't hiring, when the businesses say they can't make any money and they don't want to hire anybody, well, government can hire them. Government always has some money, and even if it doesn't have money now, it will have it in the future because it can raise taxes 
and ask people to pay money. So government is one way to keep capitalism going when capitalism is having a downturn. And by the way, I should mention, part of this whole idea is that capitalism, there's something called the business cycle. Capitalism goes up and down. Profits go up, and everyone's doing well, and then there's times when profits are low. So these are profits are high, and these are low profits down here. And when profits get low and companies aren't making money, that's when they lay workers off and workers end up on soup lines and stuff. So the, all of what I'm talking about, the social safety net, is meant to protect workers from the ups and downs of the business cycle. So through no fault of your own, you lost your job, but that doesn't mean you're starving. Now you can get this help. And public employment is another idea of saying when people are out of work because the business cycle is on a downturn, like a recession or a depression, we can still hire people uh, to do things that are needed because there are things that need to get done even if business doesn't want to do them. For example, during the Great Depression, there was something called the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. And the WPA hired out of work craftsmen, skilled people who were workers with good skills, who didn't have a job because of the depression. And the government said, well, we need you. We need your help doing stuff. What kind of stuff needs doing that business doesn't do? And you can answer that question if you think about Marysville, because certain things were built by the WPA. The government hired working people to come to Marysville and build things that industry wasn't ever going to build because they're not profitable. But they're things that a society needs. Can you think of things that a society needs that businesses can't make money off of, so they're not going to make it, but we need it anyway? Are there things in Marysville that you know of, maybe you learned in high school, about the WPA? Know, anybody know anything that was ever built by the WPA? Uh, well, one of them is Ellis Lake. Ellis Lake and the whole park there. So, uh, like Ellis Lake. Um, if you know Sacramento, the Tower Bridge, that big golden bridge that connects West Sacramento and downtown Sacramento, that was the WPA. Have you ever been to San Francisco and seen the Golden Gate Bridge? That was WPA. In other words, these were out of work workers hired by the government to build stuff. You hear a lot of people in America nowadays say, government can't do anything. Government doesn't know how to do anything. Only private businesses know how to do it. Well, the Golden Gate Bridge is an amazing structure that people still come from all over the world to come see. The Tower Bridge is a cool structure that still brands Sacramento as a cool place. Um, Ellis Lake, whatever you may think of it, is it's nice to have a big park, public park. Because a lot of working people, they don't have a backyard. They're living in a cramped apartment. The kids have nowhere to go. So, and government, you know, companies aren't going to build a park because parks don't make money. They're free. But government can build a park and say, hey, we have lawn, we have water, we have geese, we have things for your kids, we have fish for fishing derbies. And it's the idea that working people, if they're going to be fully healthy, happy people, they need these things. And government uh, companies aren't going to build them. So government uh, says, we'll, we'll build those things. And we're going to hire out-of-work people to build them. So if you look around Ellis Lake, there's a lot of like nice stonework and skilled work that was done by skilled workers. And the bridges that were built were done by skilled people knowing what they're doing. But because those weren't profitable things to build, bridges never make any profit. It costs a lot to build. And it takes years before, I mean, they, they take tolls from you. But it takes many, many years of toll taking for the bridge to pay for itself. So that's why a company doesn't want to be responsible for it. Um, but government does. And by building bridges and roads and parks, you're actually making the conditions right for capitalism, for private companies, to thrive. Because now they have roads that don't get backed up. They can get from San Francisco easily to Sacramento. They have parks for their workers to go play in. So yeah, they can pay their workers not much to live in an apartment while the kids still have a place to go. So it was all meant to make capitalism possible, to make, make the country able to have a sustainable capitalism. Um, and, and this kills two birds with one stone, because once you hire working people who are out of work, they start spending their money, and that helps other working people get paid and things like that. Uh, by the way, this film, this movie, uh, this play that we're doing at the end of the term here, I was given $30,000 to make the play. I'm not keeping the money to myself. I'm using the money to make the play happen. 
So we're going to be hiring people like students to come make the play. And that money was given by the state of California in something called the Creative California Creative Core. And the idea was similar to this WPA. There was during COVID, there was a lot of out of work artists. And the California government thought, if we pay out of work artists to do things that help other people, those artists will have money in their pocket, and those other people will get help. And so we'll have these nice ripple effects. I'm not an out of work artist, so I'm not keeping any of the money for myself. I'm using it to pay to make this play happen. But that's this idea. I'm just trying to show you government policies. And I would say the New Deal was one of the greatest government policies that ever happened um, because it helped raise up the, the working people. But another source of public employment, as you may know, is the military. And that's another place a lot of working people look to when they don't have good jobs, is they maybe look to the military. And that's one real way we got out of the Great Depression. So I'm med mentioning the things that helped save capitalism. Another one was, um, well, I I'm sorry, another form of public employment was World War II. So remember, the Great Depression started in 1929. All through the 1930s, the country was in this depression with a lot of people out of work and a lot of misery. And uh, these new policies started to get into, put into place, but still people were out of work. So what did the government do? Well, one thing it did was join World War II um, against the Germans and the Japanese. And why does that help the economy? Well, now we have to build a bunch of stuff. Before, the companies were saying, well, we don't want to build anything because no one's buying anything. Well, the government's buying now. We're buying ships, we're buying guns, we're buying bullets, and we need you companies to make it. So a lot of these companies shifted their production from making you know, consumer products to making things that uh, the government needs for war. And you had to employ a bunch of people. So first of all, you had to employ a bunch of soldiers to go fight the war. And in those days, because of race issues, the only people that got hired to go kill and carry a gun were white men. But that meant there was a huge need here in America for working people to work in the factories to make the guns and the bombs and the ships. And so large numbers of people that never got jobs in America before suddenly were getting good jobs in America. Who? Well, Mexican people for one thing. The, the government said we need Mexican people to come up from Mexico and come work in the factories so that we can win this war against the Germans. Black people, most black people in America in those days were in the South in farm farms. The government said come up north, come up to where the factories are and work in the factories and make the bombs. You can't fight, we won't let black people fight Hitler. But a lot of these black people hated Hitler too because he hated black people. So they're like, well, I'll go work in a factory and make money and make guns to kill Hitler. Women were the big group that started to worry. I don't know if you ever heard of Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter is that famous image of women who got jobs in factories because the men were off fighting in World War II. And once that happened, women started seeing what's it like to get your own money and be independent and in charge of how you spend the money. A lot of them didn't want to go back after that. When we asked, you know, where did women's liberation come from in feminism? Part of it was because of getting a taste of what it's like to be independent during World War II. So this was a big thing that happened was World War II and lots of people getting employed in these new factory jobs in the northern cities like Detroit and you know places like that. But the war ended. And once the war ended, the country faced this question. How are we going to have capitalism again? Because it was failing before World War II. We had a Great Depression. People wanted socialism. Then we saved capitalism by employing people in, world, in this war. But now we need to go back to a peacetime economy where we're making consumer products again. And we need to make sure people are employed. And we need to make sure that capitalism is sustainable. And the big thing that was done was to promote the middle class. We saw that polarization is a problem because you just have haves and have nots. And that's not a stable system. I don't, it doesn't show that it's not stable here, but what if I show what if I do it this way? The have nots are like a big round ball. And you have like BB-8 here that's going to roll over because it's not stable. But what if you have a big middle class? 
in between the half sums. The half sums, a big broad middle class, broad meaning it all groups, all races, all genders, uh, all parts of the country. If you have a wide middle class in America, it can stabilize that system of capitalism, keep it flying straight. And how do you create a middle class? The main way is through home ownership. Well, first of all, college, higher education. What makes somebody middle class? What do we mean when we say middle class? Well, it means that you're making more than a regular worker, but it also means that you have higher education than a typical worker. And in this new form of capitalism that was being envisioned, it was clear that we we're going to need a group of people that are not just workers, but are also not capitalists. What kind of people are those? Well, professionals and managers. If you manage a factory, if you're a guy on the factory floor telling workers what to do, you're not exactly a capitalist. You're not a guy who makes money on the stock market and sits around in his yacht all day, but you're making more than a worker makes and you're in a different position socially than the guy who's just a, a work, you know, a frontline worker. So managers are a group of people that are in the middle class. Professionals are another. Professionals are people like nurses and doctors and dentists and lawyers, people who can serve working people and serve non-working, you know, capitalists, but they aren't themselves in either boat. They're not working for the capitalists and they're not themselves owning large numbers of workers and stuff like that. And so professional class of people, this professional and manager class. But to get into that class, you need some higher skills. You need to know how to do stuff like be a doctor or a nurse or a teacher or a dentist. And so the government realized we're going to need to expand higher education. In those days, higher education was only for rich white guys. In California, for example, in the 1930s, the only Universities you really have were Stanford and Berkeley and UCLA. And if you're a rich white male, you could go to those places. But in the 1940s, when World War II ended, so World War II ended in 1945. So just to give you our timeline here, 1929 is the stock market crash. And 1945 is when the war ends. And as the war, as people are coming home from the war, as the war is ending and America is trying to figure out how to manage the post-war economy, uh, the idea is we're going to grow the middle class. So how much, uh, so higher education was expanded. You see it right here in California. This community college is an example. This one's older than most of them, but the vast majority of the junior colleges, they called them, were built during the 1940s and 50s and 60s. It was a time when the government said in California, we want people whose parents never went to college to go to college. And not only the, Cal the community college system, but the state college system. So I used to teach at Cal State Long Beach, and Cal State Long Beach, their team name is the 49ers. And we're the 49ers. Why are they the 49ers? They're way down in Southern California. There was no gold mining down there. They're called the 49ers because that campus, Cal State Long Beach, was built in 1949. And it was the first, one of the first Cal State schools that was meant to be the new university system for the non-rich white people, for working white people, for working non-white people, for women to go and learn, and learn to be things like cops and uh, doctors and, law, and you know, well, nurses and teachers and that middle class of, and managers professional managerial class. And so they expanded higher education. It was a big investment to spend billions of dollars to build all these new campuses so that the children of these uh, you know, working people could go to, uh, go to college. And the other idea was to grow, expand home ownership. If you own your own home, then you're not really just a have-not. You're not really a have either if you own your own home because you can't really make money with your home. I mean, nowadays you kind of can, but it's not like owning a factory. It's not like owning a huge acreage that you can plant a peach orchard on. 
It's just a home. But at least it's a piece of property. And it's a piece of property that goes up in value when other property goes up in value. So if you're a homeowner, you start to think a little bit like a capitalist. You start thinking about stock prices and property prices, and you're hoping your investment you know, appreciates and goes up and stuff like that. And so, um, so the idea here was if we can get more Americans to own their own homes, they're not going to want to join a socialist party or a communist party and want to overthrow capitalism. They're going to be owning people that own their home, that have a good job, that are happy with this system that they live under that aren't going to want to overthrow the system. And so it was a way of, again, and they're going to be middle class people. They're not just going to be exploited workers. They're going to be people with some stake, stakeholders in the system and not wanting to see it. If you have a revolution, then you lose your property and your property values go down and stuff like that. And people don't want to see the disruption of a revolution when they are homeowners. At least that was the idea. And so the government made a very conscious attempt in the, as World War II ended to get more and more Americans to go to college and more and more Americans to start owning their own homes. And by doing this, we'll create a new post-World War II economy. The other idea of owning homes is it's perfect for consumer economy because we can't be building ships anymore and guns anymore and bombs anymore because the war is over. So what can we build? Well, we can build refrigerators and TVs and you know, washing machines, and all the consumer products, all the appliances that people are gonna to wanna to put in their home. So once you become a homeowner, then you wanna start buying stuff for your home. And if you're buying stuff, then capitalism is happy to make the stuff that you're wanting to buy. So this new model was, now that we've ended World War II, we're gonna really create this Fordist model that Ford predicted of working people being happy to go to work because they're making decent money and they get lots of nice things to buy with their decent money. And if you have decent pay and decent stuff to buy, then you're not gonna be a revolutionary Marxist and a communist. You're gonna be a happy American with a new American way of life. And one of the policies that was part of all of this to make it happen was the GI Bill. So I was saying a brilliant policy GI Bill to me is one of the most genius government programs that ever happened. We still have it, you might have heard of it, but it was money for, for enlistees, money for soldiers. The idea was we need to kill two birds with one stone here as the government because the World War II was ending and you had two million soldiers coming back, two million soldiers that just fought in Japan, that fought in Germany, that fought in Italy, that fought in China. They are guys that have been killing people for five years. They've been living in the mud. They've been eating nothing. They've been talking to no women. Do you want two million guys like that back in your country? It could destabilize the country to have two million angry, violent, sex-starved men, young men in your country. What are we gonna do about this? Well, we've got to find a way to get these men stable, get them settled down. How do we settle down two million men? Give them money. And if they have money, what can they do with the money? Money for college. Or money for buy your own home. For a down payment. Each soldier was given, basically, in today's dollars, like 100,000 bucks. not just cash, but they were said, if you want to go to school, we'll pay you up to $100,000 per school. If you want to buy a home, you can have up to $100,000. It wasn't that exact amount then, but it's a, the value of what they got then is, you could say in today's terms, it would be similar. Like we said to you guys, you came back from Iraq, here's 100000 bucks. And what were they going to do with that money? Well, go to college, buy their own homes, and the idea was to make them marriageable. If you are now a guy that's a college graduate, or a homeowner, or both, you're marriageable. And you're going to settle down, you're going to find yourself a nice honey, she's going to be so proud of her soldier, returning soldier man, and you guys are going to buy a nice little home, a little starter home, maybe even continue your college education, become the, do the doctor you always wanted to be, own your own home, and thank you for serving your country, and giving all these men the chance to do this, 
where the seeds of a whole new middle class, a whole new middle class arose in America as the children, the families. We call this, by the way, the baby boom. You've heard of boomers? Well, making all these 2,000, 2 million soldiers marriageable, they did marry, and they started having kids. And America had a huge boom in the number of kids that were being born. During the 19, so 1945, until about 1955 or so, a lot of babies getting born in America. It was peacetime, the war's over, people were happy, rock music was starting to get played on the, on the radio. People had money in their pockets because of this New Deal idea and because of the GI Bill. And so it was a booming time, and lots of babies got born. And that meant lots of houses got sold, and the houses that got sold uh, got filled up with things like TVs and refrigerators and washing machines, and so capitalism was booming again. Instead of a Great Depression, we had a great, what I'm going to call a golden age of capitalism. For the next 40, 50 years, America was great. When we talk about America being great again, as some people like to talk about, they're talking about this time in America, when America was booming, and things were doing great. When did they stop doing so great? Well, 1945 was when World War II ended. And we're in 2024 now. I like to say that it was around 1985, that there's a change in America and a change in capitalism. So about 40 years of what I would call the golden age of capitalism. Why was it a golden age? Well, what you had was a rising blue collar middle class. A blue collar middle class. What does blue collar mean? Blue collar means you're working. You're a working person. You know, uh, there are white collar middle class. Those are the professionals and managers we talked about. So if you get to work as a doctor, a lawyer, or something like that, that's called white collar middle class professional. But during this time, we also have this rising blue collar middle class, meaning people working in factories. We're now in the middle class. If you worked at, at a Ford company in the 50s and 60s, you probably made in today's dollars like $85,000 a year. You probably got two to four weeks of vacation each year. You got full medical and dental benefits completely paid for. And this is a guy working in a factory, not a guy like me, a you know, professor or something like that. And so that's what we mean by blue collar middle class. It was a manufacturing-based economy. Manufacturing means making stuff. So if you have a factory, a big facility where stuff is actually made, what was made in America in the 40s, 50s, 60s? Well, cars are one of the things we're famous for. So Detroit was the heart of the car industry, and we had Fords and Chevys and all the kinds of cars that America was famous for. And the rest of the world wanted our cars and stuff like that. And uh, the rest of the world was looking at America and our economy and saying, wow, you guys are amazing over there. You have these great cars. You have all this cool culture, cool movies, cool music, rock music, and things like that. And we want to be just like America. Well, what? And you had rising, when I say rising, each generation was doing better. So like the baby boomers, the kids that were born to the, to the soldiers, they were doing way better than the, their parents had ever done, their grandparents had ever done. And the, their children, which are Generation X, you know, something like that, were supposed to be doing better uh, than they were doing. But anyway, uh, so it seemed like each generation was getting better. So like you make more money than your parents and you get higher education than your parents did. And you're rising, your family's rising. I should mention here that the home ownership policies that were promoted were mainly promoted among white people. And the government was very careful. They said, we don't want to put a bunch of black and 
Mexican and white people together in the same neighborhood, because who knows what kind of conflicts that might lead to. So the first working people they decided to give homes to were white people. And that's a problem nowadays, because if we talk about what's called intergenerational wealth, meaning did your grandparents own their own home? And a lot of white families can say, yeah, they did, and I inherited it. And my parents bought a home, and in fact, I'm inheriting two or three homes. Whereas there's a lot of Mexican families, black families that say, well, my grandparents never had a home. And we never, well, our, they didn't build up intergenerational wealth so that I'm inheriting two or three homes now. So when you say, like, a lot of white people don't feel like they're, I mean, feel like they're struggling in America today, and they are. But the difference between them and Latino families and black families often is this intergenerational wealth. And part of the difference can be traced to this government policy that was, and, and part of the reason was because only white soldiers were allowed to fight in World War II. So the only people that got access to the GI Bill mainly were white people. And in some of these neighborhoods where the homes were affordable, they even had restrictive housing covenants that said you can't sell this home to a non-white person. And so we have whole neighborhoods like in Sacramento and stuff that were mainly white for a long time by law. So when people tell you America is not a racist country, I mean, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so a lot of white families were doing much better, and, and Latino families and black families at least were getting into these good middle class, blue collar middle class jobs. Something changed though around the 1980s, and nowadays we don't really have a manufacturing based economy in America anymore. We have a service based economy. What's the difference between service and manufacturing? Well, we don't really make that much in America anymore. We don't have big factories pumping out huge numbers of cars and refrigerators and things like that. Most of you, if you're studying to be something, it's not to go be a manager of a factory somewhere. It's probably to do a service. What are services? Well, like if you're studying to be a nurse, that's medical services. If you're studying to be a teacher, that's education services. If you're studying to be you know, retail, you know, manager, that's retail service. You're not making the clothes that Gap is selling, but you're managing the store where the Gap clothes are being sold. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm, uh, so in America, most of us are in service. We're not in manufacturing. Manufacturing's happening, but it's not happening here. Uh, we have to think about that. Where is it happening? And nowadays, America has what some people call a new economy. So instead of this golden age of capitalism, we now have in America since 1985, the new economy. What's new about it? Well, it's service-based. We don't have much of a blue collar middle class anymore. In other words, this blue collar middle class was based on go live, working in factories and getting a good unionized job. In other words, these blue collar middle class people were unionized. And nowadays, we don't have many factories in America, and we don't have as many unions as we used to have. And so what do we have in America? Well, in the service-based economy, we have kind of what's called a, a two-tiered economy in terms of employment, a two-tiered labor market. There's high-end service jobs. Over here, we have blue-collar middle-class jobs, I should mention. These jobs are these unionized jobs in factories where you get paid well and you get benefits and all that stuff. But in our service economy, if you're in a high end service job, you have good pay and good benefits. And, uh, but it's also high skill. You need a lot of education usually to get that. Low end service, though are jobs that usually have low pay and no benefits, if any, or maybe few benefits, if any, or no benefits. And they don't require much skill. They're low or no skill. And in America, a lot of us these days are facing this kind of employment. This is like low-end retail. Like if you work at Walmart, if you're a Walmart associate, you fall in this group. If you are in food service, most of the time, you're in this group. If you're in like lower end medical 
service, you're in this kind of group, like janitors and stuff like that, and orderlies and things like that. Um, most of, you know, that when they say there's jobs being created in America, you can ask, well, what kind of jobs? If they're high-end service jobs, you know, high-end jobs, then maybe that's good. But if it's a bunch of jobs that don't pay well, that have long hours, that don't give you benefits, for a lot of people in America for a while there, they've raised the minimum wage in America in most places. So you can now get like $15 an hour in a lot of places. But for a while there in America, just a few years ago, the minimum wage was like seven bucks. And so you could say, well, can you get out of poverty making $7 an hour? If you work full time, 40 hours a week at like even $9 an hour, $10 an hour, you still actually fall below what's called the poverty line. We mentioned those service, I mean, those social safety net programs. Um, well, what has happened to them? Uh, but uh, if they still exist, to get them, you have to be below a certain income. And a lot of our jobs, pay so little that even if you worked full time at them, you'd actually be lower than the income level for the, the program. So if you can ask, well, why would I work if being poor, if working full time means I'm still poor and I qualify for poverty assistance, then why work at all? Why not just hang out and get the, the assistance? And so a lot of poor people are accused of being lazy and stuff, but if work doesn't pay a lot more than poverty, if work puts you in poverty, then You'd be stupid, really, to spend all this time working uh, when you can you still get the services, get the programs other ways. But anyway, what I'm trying to show is all these changes that have happened. So we don't have the good blue-collar middle-class jobs anymore. We, they've been replaced by low-end service jobs in most cases. We don't have a strong social safety net. So over here, we also had a strong social safety net so that even poor people got help and could join the middle class. Nowadays, we have a much weaker social safety net. We have, um, they ended welfare. So we don't have welfare in America anymore. We have something called aid to families, uh, aid to dependent families with needy children. Um, but they don't have, and it's temporary assistance, TANF they call it, temporary aid to needy families. But they don't have this thing where if I'm poor, I can still get income from the government. They changed that. It's much harder to get unemployment insurance. It's much harder. Social Security, they say it's going to be gone. 19, like 2030, 2034, Social Security will not be able to pay its bills anymore. And so you guys are paying into Social Security now if you have a job. But you may be told one day, sorry, that fund is gone. We didn't take care of the working people. And so what I'm saying is a lot of the things that made capitalism succeed, that saved capitalism, that created this golden age of capitalism, a lot of those things are now being taken away. So we don't have a social safety net. We don't have a blue collar middle class. We don't have a, uh, 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 what was I gonna say, unions. So, uh, all this, so now, all these things I'm putting over here, over here you can say much fewer unions or workers aren't unionized. Strong social safety net, weak social safety net. Um, and it's harder to get into those social safety net programs. But like I say, it's ironic that even if you work full time, you still qualify for some of them. In fact, Walmart was a place where if you worked at Walmart, they would show you in the break room. Did you know that you, a Walmart associate, qualify for these government programs? Walmart didn't give health care to its own workers. You know, a good unionized job at a factory used to get healthcare through your employer. Walmart said, go get healthcare through the government. And yet Walmart is a, co is a company that politically would say, we hate government and we're against socialism and we don't think we should be taxed anything. But as a business, they were saying to their workers, yeah, go get healthcare from the government, not from us. So I always thought Walmart was super uh, hypocritical for saying that they care about working people, you know, they help you live better and with low prices, but their own working people, they refuse to give basic benefits to, like healthcare and dental and stuff like that. And so, um, so also something changed in America and I see you're starting to want to pack up. Um, what changed? Can you think of what am I describing here? What have I not said that could help explain why we don't have factories in America anymore? We don't have protections for working people in this country anymore. We don't have much of a middle class anymore. What, uh, 
what began to change in the 1980s, do you think, that explains this change? Where is the manufacturing happening if it isn't happening in Detroit and America? China. China, yeah. So it, what explains that? Did China come steal our jobs or uh, what happened? Well, what happened was the global economy happened and the capitalists of our country decided we don't want to have a new deal anymore with working people where we pay them well and they buy our stuff. We want to get out of that deal and we want to go pay working people somewhere else to work for a lot less than the working people here in America are working for. So working people, in other words, have fought through the labor movement and other means to get the good treatment that they had. And in the 1980s, American capitalism began to say, we don't want to do business with American workers anymore. We want to go somewhere else. Where did they go? Not immediately to China, but one of the first places uh, was uh, Mexico. And there was this area called the Maquiladora region on the border of Mexico, where they built a bunch of car factories and paid Mexican people to work in them a dollar an hour. So going back to like before Fordism, going back to this idea that let's pay working people as little as possible to make these cars, because now we're going to sell them all over the world, and we just want to make them as cheaply as possible. So what we need to, our next question we need to ask to understand conflict theory is, what is globalization? And, you know, the big, uh, it's really a big question for all Americans right now, because this whole question of do you want Trump to be your president, or do you want somebody else to be your president, a lot of the debate comes down to this question over globalization, at least Trump's claims. He's not for globalization, he's for helping American working people get back on their feet. And yet he also says, I hate socialism and communism. So I don't know, so why do American people want to follow Trump, who's a Republican, instead of the Democrats, which were the ones that created the New Deal and did all this stuff. And there were, by the way, Democrats like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who said she wanted a Green New Deal, a whole New Deal, a new New Deal, that would be for working people, but that would also protect the environment. So a lot of Democrats were saying, we need to repeat what we did back in the 30s and get capitalism back on its feet and working people back on their feet. Meanwhile, you have Trump saying as a hardcore capitalist, he's gonna help working people get back on their feet. And so American people have to figure out which is the truth they're getting. I think sociology is a better source of truth than politicians. But uh, anyway, we'll come back to this question of what is globalization, and we'll find out about that on Thursday. We're also going to watch a video, and then your exam's coming up. So get ready for next week. On Tuesday will be the review for the exam, and Thursday will be when the exam opens up for a week for you to take it. But before that, there's going to be a video I'm going to have you watch. And so get ready for all of that. And yeah, we're at home, get ready to. We're going to have a video and then the review and then the exam. All right. Thank you for being here. See you later. See ya.